evening. Oh, we've got really good sound this evening. That's great. Thank you, great sound. Um, my name is Kim Dismont Robinson. I'm the Folk Life Officer for the Department of Community and Cultural Affairs. And I would, like to in, uh, I would like to thank you for coming this evening to the Historical Heartbeats Lecture Series, Folk Tales Afloat. Um, I would like to um, acknowledge the presence of Dame Jennifer Smith, Speaker of the House, um, excuse me, Deputy Speaker of the House, and Minister Terry Lister, who's here as well, and to thank you both for coming. Um, and uh, for some of you who may have realized that our title was a little bit unorthodox, our folk tales are not actually afloat this evening. <laughs> We're doing this sort of picnic style. And as you can see um, with the Historical Heartbeat series, generally we do like to have a, a very sort of informal approach. Um, we want you to enjoy our presentation this evening, and we want you to also enjoy the surroundings. Um, part of what makes Bermuda so beautiful is our environment as well as our people. And we have both of those fine elements here this evening. So thank you all for coming. Um, I would just ask if you could please turn off your cell phones. <laughs> we still have them here over in Daryl's Island, too. <laughs> I've got to turn off mine, too. And um, I would also uh, like, uh, for those of you who have refreshments, if you could refrain from eating them while our speaker is telling her folk tales, we'd appreciate it. We're going to just spend probably about 15 or 20 minutes after the lecture just sort of sitting and enjoying the environment afterwards as well. So if you haven't finished um, your snacks at that point, uh, you can do so then. OK, um, well, our speaker this evening is a woman who needs no introduction. This is, what I told, this is how I told her I was going to introduce her when she wouldn't give me any info uh, as far as a bio. So <laughs> but um, we're very lucky to have uh, Ms. Maxwell, Mrs. Florence Webb Maxwell, here this evening. For those of you who have never heard her folk tales, you are in for an absolute treat. We're very excited um, that she agreed to present for us this, after, this evening. And um, without further ado, I'm going to turn the mic over to Mrs. Maxwell. Thank you, Dr. Kim. And I must tell you that since this is going to be folk tales, you have to get a little bit more intimate than this. You're too spread out. It's get a little closer because I, I like to have eye contact. And can you, can you sort of just get in a bit closer? It makes it easier. Good. My, my, my son is obeying immediately. <laughs> Yes, that's yeah, that's yeah. Okay, are we all ready now? I'm going to do a Bermuda folk tale. I don't know how many of you have heard Bermuda folk tales. Unfortunately, we have not held on to them in bulk. And I discovered in, 19, in the 70s that we, I could not find a collection of Bermuda folk tales. And this was very embarrassing because I was in the United States. And as usual, if you can't find something, then you have to go and look for it and produce it. So I'm going to do a folk tale. And it's called Red Head and Bloody Bones. Now, if you have a weak heart, you can go back to the boat. Because I'm not going to be responsible. I didn't sign anything, but I'm saying it verbally. Uh, this uh, story, Red Head and Bloody Bones, actually is heard in Yorkshire, England, as Red Head and Bloody Bones. And if you remember old-time Bermudians, I don't think we still do it, as, although I'm old time too. And Bloody was called Bloody. And this story was told to frighten children. And now today, it would be called abuse. 
But in those days, in order to get children straightened out, you told them a story. The Boogeyman and Redhead and Bloody Boons is one of them. And as I said, it came from England, and when it landed here, as, when it left England as Rawhead and Bloody Boons, Bermudians took it up as Redhead and Bloody Boons. And Redhead and Bloody Boons was really scary. Well, it started out that there was an old woman who lived in a wooden house near Shinburn Alley in St. George. Now, people thought she was a witch because she could see ghosts. But what was really back of that, she was born with a call. And I don't know how many of you know what the call is. And I'll tell you later. For those who don't know what a call is, I don't think we still have babies born with calls. Do we do? Any midwives here, doctors? Well, anyway, this old lady was born with a call. And it meant that she could not only see the supernatural, but she could not drown. And she had to hold on to that call as if it were a treasure. So she wrapped it in silk and kept it near her bed. Now, because she had the gift of seeing goats and was labeled a witch, she was constantly taken to the dock and stool and plunged in and out, plunged in and out. But it didn't matter because her call saved her. And when the St. Georgians got tired of that, they left her alone. But that peace didn't last long because the children started to pick on her. And they would throw stones in her window. They did everything to annoy her. She even said, boo. But they weren't frightened, not those children. So she decided to get a ferocious dog. And that dog was so ferocious, it looked like it had all teeth. Eyes were teeth, tail teeth, everything looked like teeth. He was so ferocious looking. But when the children were done sticking at him, poking at him, the poor dog wound his tail over his shoulder, not even between his legs, he was so embarrassed, and off he went. And someone said, well, they ended up seeing him somewhere near one of the restaurants where he was sleeping peacefully after meal. So this went on and on and t until the old lady decided to get some geese. And she bought two geese, male and female, of course, and decided she would not, if, if you know anything about geese, geese can be more saucy than dogs. But at least these geese were because they might have been fed on papa. I don't know. But they were so ferocious that when they had their little offsprings, they were twice as ferocious, and no one dared go near the old lady's land. Even the children stayed away. Now, since this story is about children not behaving, this is where Redhead and Bloody Bones comes in. Redhead and Bloody Bones only appeared where children didn't behave. Think of the field day he would have today. <laughs> well, he came and he started because he, what he really wanted was the old woman's call. Because if he had that, he wouldn't drown and he would take over sea and land. All right. That was his motive. He wanted to get in her house and get that call. 
Now, you couldn't see him during the day because he was a ghost. But you could feel him if you went near him. And very few people risk that. So what happened was that people told their children, you better stay in the house or red head and bloody bones will get you. He will get you. He will get you. And after red head and bloody bones, this um, ate up most of the geese that the old lady had. Those kids knew this was serious business, and their parents did too. No more laughing matter, no more excuses. And children stayed in the house. After a while, parents, adults stayed in too. Now, just, you don't even have to close your eyes to do that. Imagine Bermudians having to stay indoors because they're afraid to go out. There's no television, no Game Boy, nothing modern. You just stayed in the house. Well, I won't even have to tell you, there was a lot of bickering that went on. They started to bicker and fight, and they said, now, wait a minute. We can't have this. So during the day, two of them sneaked up to old auntie and said to her, you're the only person who could get rid of red head and bloody bones. You can see him because you see ghosts. Now, she wasn't vindictive. She could have told them, that's what you were dumping me in and out of the dock and stool about. But she didn't, because she wanted to get rid of him as well. She said, all right, I'll have to think up something. Please, they begged, please, so that we can go outdoors and enjoy Bermuda again. Well, she waited and waited, and waited. And one day, in fact, correction, one night, she happened to look out of her window. Those who have weak hearts, please leave. Red head and bloody bones was creeping up in her yard. Now, he was horrible looking. His red head was really a rotted skull. And his eyes were sunken in, and blood streamed out of the eyes like tears. And when he walked, his bones rattled. And she, uh-huh, says old auntie, he's coming to get my call. So what she did, she quickly changed into a very light dress, took off her heavy shoes, took her call from under the bed where she kept it, and walked out through the front door. Red head and bloody bones was in the back. And she sneaked off because she was going to St. Peter's graveyard to bury the call so it would be safe. Well, as she walked along, briskly, of course, she could hear something in the back, rattling of bones. And that smell, red head and bloody bones, was following her. She started to run. He ran. She ran faster. He ran faster. She said, oh my goodness. And the call was tied on her wrist because she did not want to lose it. Whatever happened, I cannot lose my call. Well, she raced and raced, and she saw the ocean in front of her. And with one leap, she jumped in. So did Red Head and Bloody Bones. Now, he couldn't swim, but
but he was tall enough that all he had to do was walk. And she was swimming along, and he was walking. And as he walked, the waves were just moving along, and she said, oh, goodness, I'm going to lose my call. And just as he got near to her and he snatched it, it fell off and went into the water. That was a relief. Because immediately she was able to swim away and he unfortunately had gotten into very deep water. And he couldn't move. He couldn't move anymore. And she won her as he went down. She was back on the shore. And when she looked behind her, in the horizon, there was red head and bloody bones, no more. Well, that ended the problem with red head and bloody bones. Because after that, children learned their lesson, and parents learned discipline. They didn't laugh anymore when their children did things that were naughty because they didn't want a repeat of red head and bloody bones. But I'll tell you a story on that. Bermudians have not forgotten this. And when you see a red glow on the horizon, you know that that is red head and bloody bones struggling to come back. And what's going to bring him back? Naughty children. <laughs> Are you still awake? I'll give you another one. Now this, the story I'm going to tell you is called Counting the People. Now this story it's interesting in that I wasn't going to include it in my collection because it's more like an anecdote than a story. But something happened when I collected it and I did some research on it and discovered it's the only Bermuda story that I could put my hands on that came from Africa. It's the only one I was able to touch with an African motif. What is interesting about it is that there was only one part in it that made me realize it was African. But I'm going to tell you the Bermudian version because that's typical of folk tales. They don't need a passport to go from country to country. And when they do travel from place to place, they get adapted like redhead and bloody burns, rawhead and bloody burns. And this one, counting the people, two fishermen. Now, they, one story said that these fishermen were in Warwick. But I prefer the Pembroke version for obvious reasons. And the person who told it to me was from Pembroke anyway. Well, these two fishermen were on their way home with a voyage of fish. And the rain came, so they ran into Pembroke, the Pembroke church, near the graveyard under the porch. Now, you're all familiar with the Pembroke Church. And while they were there, a man was walking past. Now, they didn't see him. But he heard them say, one for you, one for me, one for you, one for me, one for you, one for me. Well, he didn't want to hear any more than that. He rushed to him, knocked the doors down, and he said, guess what? God and the devil are in the graveyard counting out souls. <laughs> and his family said, that's ridiculous. 
they were ready to eat. And then his older brother, was he was hungry. And you're talking this nonsense? Oh, come on, get out of this. He said, it's, it's true. They were saying, one for you, one for me. And, 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 and they're, they're just doing cells down there. And finally, he persuaded his brother to go down with him. And when he passed the gate, didn't hear anything. And the brother is about to say, you took me from my good, delicious supper for this. Then one of the voices said, don't forget the two at the gate. <laughs> now what they meant, they, in their hurry, they dropped two fish at the gate. Well, those brothers didn't wait to know anything. They rushed home, and that hungry brother, he went on a diet. <laughs> now that story, as I said, came from Africa, and it was, it's called the talking stone. And um, this man was walking through the land, and he kicked this stone. And the stone said, why did you kick me? And he said, a talking stone? And he went back to tell his um, chief what had happened. And the chief said, I walk past that stone all the time. I never hear anything. You better come now. And of course, he went with him, kicked the stone. Nothing happened. Well, the chief had promised to cut his head off if the stone didn't talk. Then another one was the talking skull, another African version. And uh, the skull, when, when the, the man kicked the skull, the skull said, and why, you know, why, you why did you kick me? Why are you here? The boy asked, asked the skull. And the skull said, foolishness brought me here, and cleverness will bring you here. So when he went back to tell the story and was promised a headless body if it didn't happen, same thing happened to him. And when his skull rolled, the other skull said, I told you so. <laughs> Foolishness got me here. Cleverness got you here. So those two stories. Now you're saying, how in the world does that tie up with counting the people? Now when those stories went to the United States, there were two men in a graveyard and they were sharing their apples, one for you, one for me. And when this other man walked past with his master, because it became a slave story after that, then the same thing happened. Their heads didn't get cut off, but they were lashed. Now, because Bermuda never earned up to slavery, you couldn't have that story. So there were two fishermen, very safe. So Bermuda's story, and this was told to a very famous um, folklorist as well, two fishermen, one for you, one for me. So Bermuda's stories were almost lost because they have to be retained, maintained, and talked about. And your being here this evening is an example of what has always happened. People in a community got together and they heard their own stories. So you have heard two. One for you, one for me. And red heads, and because I'm not allowed to swear, bloody boons. Thank you very much. Did you turn it on? No? 
I have to be careful that I don't say something to the mic off. <laughs> if you have any questions, you might want to ask me questions. And I'll be honest with you, if I can't answer, I'll say, I don't know. But I'll try. I'm glad you asked that at this point because I don't, you want to, yes. I've been embarrassed by this question in the past. <laughs> I'm so glad you asked that question actually. Um, as I had said earlier, um, as I told you, you're in for a treat. Um, and I think everybody here will certainly agree that Ms. Maxwell's folk tales are really wonderful. So I'd like to thank you, first of all, for, um, for gracing us with these folk tales. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but to answer the question, um, Ms. Maxwell and I, I call her Auntie Florence. <laughs> um, I know I'm not the first person to harass her about the collection, but hopefully I will be the last person to harass her about the collection. Um, we've actually been working in conjunction um, with each other and the Department of Community and Cultural Affairs is looking to publish Mrs. Maxwell's Book of Folk Tales later this year. Yeah. So if you've enjoyed this, as I know you have, um, I would say if you could please keep an eye out for it. It should be available. It'll be available before Christmas. So um, that would be an absolutely stunning Christmas present, I think, for many people. And I'll let you share the actual title of it. I hope I don't get a senior moment at this stage. And we toyed around with the title, and we came up with the, uh, the Spirit Baby, and it's based on one of the folk tales. I'm not going to tell you any more than that. And I've been very, very fortunate to get Al Seymour Sr. to be the illustrator. And Al and I go way, way, ever so far back. We were both centralites, now Victor Schoolites, for those who are younger. And I can remember him as a young fellow. We, Mr. Scott used to have I Stedfords and all kinds of competitions and uh, have us enter the exhibition and what have you. And I know of people who did not bother to enter when they saw Al Seymour's drawings because they knew he was going to just take the prizes. And I'm very, very fortunate that he has consented because, as I said, we go way back and it's just great. <laughs> Any more questions? Okay, now... In the 70s, anybody here too young to know the 70s? I was in um, Atlanta, Georgia, and I was finishing off my um, degree in library service. And in the class, the ethnic materials for children and young adults, the professor talked about motifs and folk tales. And she went around and she said, tell us a folk tale from your country. And it dawned on me, I don't have any, I don't know any. And that's embarrassing to be sitting with your peers at that age too, and not come up with a folk tale. I knew Cinderella, I knew all the British ones, but not one Bermudian story. And the other students could get up, the Nancy stories at that time, and remember this was back in the 70s, I hadn't even heard of the Nancy story. And a lot of Bermudians hadn't either. They, they today say yes, they did. They're now admitted. But back in our day, they didn't. And all kinds of stories. And I realized that folk tales travel. 
where are the Bermuda folk tales? And I went to the professor. I crawled up to the professor, which would be more accurate. And I told her that I've discovered something. Bermuda has no folk tales. What happened? So she took me to a professor, Dr. Richard Long, and I'll get into that afterwards too. She took me to this professor and asked if I could sit in on his folklore class and pick up something on folk tales, which I did. Now what happened, he told me, go back to Bermuda and interview the elderly. I wasn't elderly yet. Don't ask for folk tales or you'll get fake tales because folk tales have to have motifs and they have to connect and talk to them, just talk in general to them and tape. Now this was back in, at the time and people weren't using tapes as, as much as they're using them now. And, and he, he warned me that certain elderly people might not want to talk on the tape, go gently. But I managed to get about 50 of them. But when I returned, I was almost in tears. There was, I said, Dr. Long, there's not one once upon a time story. What's happened? He said, okay, let's look at these. And he came up with not just folk tales, but folklore, you know, um, um, superstitions. You don't call them superstitions, you call them beliefs. He came uh, all kinds of categories, uh, medicine, go through each one, a lot of work. And I did, I enjoyed that. But the stories, there was maybe one story with a fish in it. And another story, redhead and bloody bones, with really a skeleton. And I said, what do I do now? You have to be the folklorist. You've got the motif. Go from there. And that's what happened. But I used to really tell to, to kids, being in the library, I was obligated to do folk tales or stories, story time. And one day, I'll never forget this. This is probably my most passionate story. I was invited to Westgate to tell stories to the prisoners. I got there late because of the bus. Now, I don't know if any of you have been to Westgate. I mean, the way I had to go. Get that straight. <laughs> And I went to Westgate, no one was around, not one guard. And I walked up to the door and rushed back. And I walked up and rushed back and finally I said, no, I, I've got to go in. And when I got to the door and stood there long enough, a voice said, press the button and come in. <laughs> I was too nervous not to. I pressed the button and went in. No one around again. Then a voice said, come up the steps. <laughs> I went up the steps in fear and trembling. And when I got to the top of the steps, there was a guard grinning from one end of his face to the next. I was not smiling. But I couldn't say or do what I wanted to do because this was already prison. So when I walked into the room, and um, the person who had invited me, in, uh, um, invited me to come on in, uh, the, pr the prisoners were seated waiting in the library. And I said, I'm going to tell you a Bermuda story. And they started laughing, and, huh. and all kinds of racket went on. And I was about to say, can't you behave yourselves? Then it dawned on me, they're here because they didn't behave. So what tactic can I use now? So I quickly asked, anybody from St. George's? Hands went up. Anyone from Somerset? Hands went up. I said, well, this is a bailers based story. And they sat like that. And when I finished, 
they wanted another story. But it was too late. I'd gotten there too late. So um, one fellow said, well, next time. I said, I don't want to see you here next time. <laughs> but that, that incident, and I'm sharing it with you, to let you see that we need our own story, the familiarity of it. And that is important. And even with the prisoners, not a peep, because they could identify certain scenes. OK? Any others? Oh, you, you want to know what a call is? Get it for. OK. Did they get the other questions? Because I've forgotten them. OK. Um, the young lady there wants to know I, what a call is. And it's spelled C-A-U-L. Anybody know? P put your hands up real high if you know. OK. I'm, should I let one of them explain? Oh. Whoa. Explain what a call is. And we'll, I'll tell you if she's right. Come on, come on. Here, you have to hold this so they can hear you. You're trying to say it? Here. Go on. Okay. I want to get up here. When a baby is born with a call, with a web, you call a, a web or something around its face. Yeah. 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 That's what it is. Yeah, membrane or, or web around the face. Not all babies are born with that, but there are certain babies they say are born with a call, and they're supposed to be very special. Were you born with one? No, oh. No, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. You see that? They would take it and put it in a bottle with alcohol. What else about it? Uh, was there anything else about it? You, you weren't allowed to lose it. Your mother was born with one? Does she still have it? And let me know, because I want to look at it. <laughs> it's supposed to be very special. You're supposed to be a very special baby if you're born with a call. OK? Exactly, see? So you know I wasn't lying in my story, don't you? She said a lot of things that would happen to most people wouldn't happen to the person born with the call. That's right. Special. Anybody else? Anyone else? Oh, sorry. 